would you open your Bibles to the Bread of Life Discourse in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, we'll look at uh, sections of verses 30 through 36. We're actually going to skip a few verses here and there, but I think this is an important and foundational uh, examination of why we do what we do. Now, <clears throat> let me just say, we are going to get back to the traditional means of having communion, passing the plate and the cups, and uh, instead today you have these because we bought them. <laughs> so we bought them, so we want to use them, and as soon as they're gone, we'll go back to the regular uh, means of uh, sharing and communion together. But uh, some background is going to help us with our scene a little bit. And if we back up just a few verses before ours, in verses 22 through 24 of John 6, we can identify a little bit about the where and the when of our text. And we're told on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw there was no other boat there except that one, which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people there saw Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to where? Capernaum seeking Jesus. The win of this is on the following day. Following what? Following the day where Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children, potentially 15 to 20,000 people, with five barley cakes, that would be a cake made of barley about the size of an English muffin, and two small fish. And this gives us the where and the when. But we also have another detail regarding uh, the where aspect we need to highlight for our understanding. And that is from John 6.59, which we will read uh, later. These things he said where? In the synagogue. In Capernaum. He taught in Capernaum. Now, this teaching of Jesus takes place in a synagogue in Capernaum, as we just read, to people whom he had just miraculously fed, at least many of them. And being in a synagogue further identifies the audience for us, reminding us that he's teaching a group of, Jew, a group of Jews in a synagogue, all of whom have bread on their minds. Uh, the conversation is going to reveal this, and also Jesus' correction of their thinking will happen for us this morning as well. And there's a reason for this outside of satisfying physical hunger, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, Jesus in our text is going to make the most divisive and radical statement in all of his teaching. It is so radical that after having said it, many of his disciples follow him no more. And it's in relation to his body and his blood and what they symbolize. Now, we also need to take note that this conversation or teaching took place while Jesus is still, you know, dividing humanity into two groups, so to speak. And that is those who are for him and those who are against him. And that's the same that's true today as well. You were either for him or against him. And the third category is there isn't one. You're either for him or against him. Amen. And this morning we're going to call to our minds the very things Christ asked us to remember at the Last Supper and they are represented by two things that we call the elements, or the elements of communion. And they are contained in our title this morning, which is the bread and the cup. Now, the bread obviously represents the body of Jesus, the cup obviously referring to what's in it rather than the cup itself, whether it's wine or grape juice. And this is representative of the body or the blood of Jesus. Now, in Hebrews 10, 5 to 10, we're told, therefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. And then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, meaning the old covenant, that he may establish the second, meaning the new covenant. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, all the sacrifices and offerings God ordained for the Jews were elements. 
They were elements that represented something else. It wasn't that God took any pleasure in them, nor did they accomplish anything other than what Jesus is going to point out today. The bread and the cup have the same purpose in the church age, only in the other direction. The sacrifices and offerings pointed to Jesus before he came. The elements that we'll partake in this morning point back to Jesus when he came and what he accomplished. And by the way, he's coming again. Amen. Now, like the sacrifices, the elements themselves have no power. They are not something that the Lord takes pleasure in the repeated practice of. They are, as we said, just like the sacrifices. They represent something far greater than themselves. And therefore, we're going to do what Jesus said to do when we observe the Last Supper or partake in communion. And that is to do so in remembrance of his body and his blood through the bread and the cup. Now, let me also say this. The wafer you're going to hold and what's in this little plastic cup after we pray for them are not going to turn into the actual body and blood of Jesus. When you eat it, <clears throat> when you eat the wafer, it's going to be a wafer all the way down into your tummy. And then when you drink the juice, it's going to be juice. It's going to remain juice. It's not going to transubstantiate into the body and blood of Jesus, as many have been taught under the Catholic faith. Now, I must also say that what the bread and the cup represents has the power to change. It can change us from darkness into light. It can change us from perishing into living eternally. It can change us from dead spiritually to alive spiritually. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Listen, communion is a big deal. It is a big deal. It is not some casual ritual to close out a mass or a church service. It's a solemn celebration. And we're not going to miss the meaning of it here this morning like the Jews missed. 1,500 years of sacrifices and offerings and what they were pointing to. Now, we're going to examine a scene where the meaning behind the bread and the cup are made clear. And the sad fact is that those who should have most readily understood it missed the whole thing. Well, we're not going to miss the meaning of communion. Amen? So we'll start here in John chapter 6, beginning with verse 30, and read down to verse 36 of our four stops we have this morning. So would you stand and read with me, please? John chapter 6. Verses 30 through 36. John 6, 30. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. And Lord, we are this morning among those whom you said are blessed, because we have not yet seen you. And we do believe, but we also know we will see you someday. And Lord, we are so looking forward to that time. And God, we pray that this morning that we would better understand the magnificence of what is before us and that we would never see it as some casual ritual, some church ordinance, some religious observation. But Lord, that we would see it for what it is, the body and blood of Jesus Christ represented by these two elements. We give you thanks in advance for what we'll discover in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the importance of the where this conversation takes place comes into play right away. As we know, the audience in a synagogue would not be a mixed audience of Jew and Gentile. It would be Jews, not like on the hillside or by the seaside where there were some Gentiles who would slip in and hear Jesus teaching. Now, as Jesus takes the seat of the rabbi and is teaching the Jews the spiritual meaning behind the manna that the fathers ate in the wilderness. And it was a commonly held rabbinic belief and teaching that when the Messiah came, he would be like Moses. He would be a deliverer, and he would feed them like Moses did with manna, as evidenced by their claim. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. Now, the rabbis believed that evidence that proved one was the Messiah would be temporal blessings coming through him, much like the manna in the wilderness 
And the Messiah, in their minds, would be a supplier, not really a savior. Now, there's a lot of people who look to the Messiah, Jesus, like that in that same manner. There's a lot of people today who approach Jesus more like a genie than Jehovah in human flesh. And then rabbinic mindset, the sick and the poor were sick and poor because of sin, not because they lived in a fallen world. Listen, people who love Jesus can get sick. And we live in a fallen world. And we're not promised that we're going to be healthy our whole lives. And we have struggles and we have failures and we have all these other things that many say the opposite of today, if you're really of the faith. And the rabbis taught and believed that if you're sick, it's because of sin. Well, it is, but not in the sense that they meant it. They believed that the chosen of God would have health and wealth. And if not, there's sin in your life. And they would say it just like that. <laughs> not really. But listen. The Jews had asked, what shall we do to work the works of God in verse 28? And Jesus said, believe in him whom he sent, he being the father and Jesus being the sent one. Now, the Jews then say, what sign will you perform? So they were looking for that messianic sign that they had concocted in their minds that they may believe that he's the Messiah. And that's when the Moses man of belief comes into view. Now, Jesus doesn't respond to what they say, but instead he responds to what they believe. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. And then he declares he is that bread. Now, that's the first of the seven I am statements from the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now, bread in this particular metaphor is a metonym. That's a, a word that represents something else. It's much like we would say, Washington decided, and that Washington represents the whole of the country. Well, bread here represents sustenance, spiritual in that uh, sense. And Jesus is saying to the Jews who believed that their first birth qualified them for heaven, you missed the whole spiritual message of the manna. It pointed to heavenly provision, uh, provision for your spiritual needs. And the spiritual equivalent to the statement about being the bread of life would be this, that Jesus said at the Last Supper with his disciples when communion was instituted. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus is trying to draw the Jews' attention to not just look to God as a supplier of earthly needs, though he is our provider. Amen? The Lord does care for us. He told us, seek him first, and I'll take care of the other stuff. Because their problem was they thought being born a Jew took care of their spiritual needs. And the kind of bread that Jesus was offering was not something they thought they needed, nor were they interested in it. And many seem to have that same per perception today that God is there to serve them instead of we are here to serve him. And the Jews were looking for a deliverer from Rome, not a savior from hell. And the Messiah in their minds was an earthly warrior, not a lamb of God. Certainly not even the son of God. They were looking for a man who was a lion, not a man who was a lamb. And therefore, we're told in John 5, 18, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath by committing the great crime of healing people, but also said that God was his father. And in Jewish culture, that was to make himself equal with God. Now, those who say Jesus never claimed to be God need to talk to a Jew because that's why they rejected him. He claimed to be God, making himself equal with God, saying God was his father. Now listen, here's the first thing we need to consider about Jesus' bread of life claim, the bread that comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. The first thing we need to recognize about the bread is Jesus' humanity is a salvation necessity. Jesus' humanity is a salvation necessity. Now Jesus was not just a man who exalted himself to the position of God like the Jewish leaders accused him of. He was and is the pre-existent and eternal God who put on human flesh and became the God-man. Now, many struggle with this concept, but they shouldn't. Think about it. He had to be a man in order to die. He had to be God to raise from the dead. He had to be the God-man. No mere human could meet those two conditions except one, and that is one who was fully God and fully man. And it was an absolute necessity to our salvation that Jesus put on the likeness of skin, uh, sinful flesh. And there was no reason for the Jews to miss this. Their scriptures taught them that it was so in places like Isaiah 7, 14, where we're told the Lord himself will give you a sign. 
Who is the sign coming from? The Lord. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name what? God with us. The Jews should have been looking for someone who was God with us, God in human form, who looked like us. I'm not sure what the alternative interpretation can be of this. It says a supernaturally conceived male child will be God with us, and that's exactly what it means, and that's exactly who Jesus was. And it had to be so for the reasons we mentioned a moment ago. God cannot die. He is eternal. Human flesh will die and is not eternal. But may I mention this morning that there is one generation that's going to have an instantaneous <laughs> translation into immortal incorruptibility and put on the likeness of Jesus Christ in his glorified state in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Now, I'm excited about getting in our sanctuary, but man, I'd rather go see him and be with him with everybody else. I have no interest in the individual plan. I'm a group plan guy, aren't you? Now, listen, in 1 John 4, 2 and 3, John the Beloved, who walked in, uh, with Jesus, heard him teach, was one of Jesus' innermost circle, heard Jesus privately teach him and others things, uh, Peter and John and uh, James, other things that the others didn't hear, or things that the others didn't hear. And John the Beloved said this, by this you know the Spirit of God. In other words, by this you know that God is speaking. Every spirit, say every spirit. Every spirit. every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now, John is careful to pair the proper name of Jesus with the title of Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. This is a messianic title. In other words, what John is saying, you know, it's not necessary for you to believe Jesus existed historically. You have to believe that he existed biblically, that when he got here, he was God. When he got here, he was the God man. When he got here, he was the Christ, the son of the living God. Listen, he didn't become the Christ at his baptism. He was baptized as the Christ. He is the eternal Jesus, the God with us Jesus, and lots of unsaved people believe that Jesus existed. And when we take the bread in communion, we need to back our minds up all the way to the fact that before Christ could die, he had to first become a man. It was essential to our salvation. And the King of heaven, the Lord of glory, came from heaven as the bread of life, bread being a staple of that day and ours. And he asked the question, as the bread of life today, have you come to me for eternal life? Am I your spiritual source of sustenance? In Isaiah 55, 2, the prophet will ask the same question, or at least similar. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Why are you pursuing all this stuff that can't help you? He says, listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and let your what? Soul delight itself in abundance. So obviously, Isaiah is talking about the same subject, Jesus is talking about in the Bread of Life discourse. Now, this is the question that needs to be called to mind when we come to the table. Are we living for the one who made us alive? He clothed himself in humanity in order to be capable of dying for our sins. A human body was essential for this to happen, and we are to remember the bread represents that to us when we come to the table. Now, I want to make a couple of other considerations uh, in our text from of the bread portion of our time together. So look at 47 to 52, and we'll, we'll pick up the uh, teaching there. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. What's he trying to say there? <laughs> They're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live, how long? Forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give uh, for, life, for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, have we complained about the bread from heaven metaphor? Jesus interprets it as believing in him. And eating the living bread which came down from heaven is how those who believe are made 
to live forever. And this is not just true for those in the synagogue in Capernaum. It's true for us today. Now, I'll wait a minute for that to sink in. It's true for us today. Now, much like the Jews here missed the interpretation of the metaphor and asked not only for another sign, but then on top of that, they said, after Jesus already explained to them what he meant, uh, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So, too, many people do the same today. How could Jesus be deity clothed in humanity? How could the Bible actually be true? You know what? I need more evidence. I need more signs to prove that God exists, is the argument of many today. Some would go as far to say there's absolutely not one shred of evidence that God exists. Well, I would argue with that. And here's how I'd make my argument. Here's our second observation about the bread. Jesus is absolute proof of the existence of God. Jesus is absolute proof of the existence of God. Now, we know that the heavens declare God's handiwork and glory. We know we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we know that the composition of the universe and its arrangement can only be explained through the existence of a divine creator. But that still leaves the question of who's the creator? Well, Colossians answers the question for us in 1, 15 to 18. He, Jesus, is the image, that word means icon, the physical manifestation of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. There's a title. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. That's talking about the, the unseen properties of the universe. Whether thrones or dominions, principalities and powers, there's a spiritual realm. All things, say all things. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, meaning are held together. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now, if you really think about it, Jesus didn't talk a lot about heaven. He didn't talk a lot about what it was going to be like. He told us about the Father's house. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And uh, the reason I'm going to prepare a place for you is because I'm going to come back and get you. Now, loose paraphrase, obviously, but that's what he said. But the truth is, he didn't come to tell us about heaven. He came to tell us how to get there. And he came to provide the, the way and the means for our arrival there. And in Acts 1, 1 to 3, Luke says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive, after suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then John the Beloved adds this, 21, 24 to 25, the end of his gospel record. This is the disciple who testifies of these things, John speaking of himself, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. John was an eyewitness of the, of the things he wrote. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Somebody say, Amen. you know, there's been a lot of great people throughout the ages, Nobel Prize winners, people who invented great things that impacted the whole world. I mean, we're thankful for electricity, technology, all the things that we enjoy today. But there is not one individual who has ever lived except for Jesus, who all the stuff he did couldn't be written down in books that would uh, take more than the whole world to contain. There's only one who can do that, and that's the God-man. Now, I'm thankful for the efforts of many today to pr prove that the Bible's narrative is consistent with observable evidence. But the one proof above all others concerning the existence of God is Jesus. Think about it. He's God in human flesh. He defied the laws of physics. He did creative miracles. He healed diseases. He raised the dead. He restored sight, speech, and hearing, and made the lame walk. He walked on the water. He answered unasked questions. He rebuked demons, and he conquered death. Who could do that? The God-man. He came in human flesh to be what we could never be, and that is perfect. And because he was perfect, he was able to give his life for others. And as we prepare to receive the bread or the wafer we have, we have to ask ourselves, is Jesus who I live for? Is he my bread? Is he my sustenance? Is he the staple of my life? Is he the one in whom I live and breathe and have my being? You see, this is why he came to be. He came 
in the form of the likeness of sinful flesh, not to establish one of many religions. He didn't come to be an on-demand performer of miracles or to simply meet our practical needs. He came to be our everything. He came to be our first and most significant priority in life. And, you know, maybe some things have crowded him out of first place in your life. It happens. Life gets busy. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Emotional responses to difficulties can uh, cause all kinds of things to go on in our minds, can even cause us to reschedule our priorities, uh, to meet these kind of things, or to just simply uh, be by ourselves and not be around other people. There's a bazillion things that can push Jesus off the throne of your life. And it's happened to everyone. And maybe you're there right now. And maybe for some it's even been a long season. Well, it's time to put God back where he belongs. And the only, <laughs> excuse me, the only way to do that is in a very unpopular word today, and that is to repent. And to put him back where he belongs. And, and, and listen, uh, I'm going to encourage you right now. Take this little membrane off the top portion of your cuff and pull out this, uh, whatever this thing is. Uh, it's, I'm pretty sure it's digestible. Pretty sure. But it's it's a little, some kind of wafer, and, and it's going to stay a wafer when we eat it. But what it represents is power. What it represents is transformation. What it also represents is willingness. And listen, there's something that we have to put our minds around when we come to the table and we consider the body and the blood of Jesus. He despised the cross. He despised it. The shame associated with the creator of the world hanging naked next to a busy Roman highway, he despised. He despised it to the degree where the night before it was going to happen, he said, Father, if there's another way, let it happen now. Nevertheless, what? Not my will, but thine be done. Listen, we have to remember the humility of Jesus in wrapping himself in the likeness of sinful flesh was, talk about a major step down into humanity to do something that was absolutely humiliating. And what we don't often recognize or remember is that the Romans always crucified people on the busiest highway next to the busiest highway in town. Why? Because they wanted everybody to see what happens when you defy Rome. So Jesus wasn't hung on a cross in some obscure hill somewhere where nobody could see him. He was hung on a cross right next to the road, naked. And people passed him by, and you know what? He despised it. But there was a joy set before him. You know what that joy was? You. Me. He said, I'll do it for them. I'll do it for them. I'll put what this represents on for them. I'll let them stab me in the side for them. I'll let them yank the beard from my face for them. I'll let them press down a crown of thorns on my head for them. I'll let them cover my head with a bag and punch me and say, prophesy who hit you. For them. I'll let them lay lashes on my back for them. That's what this body is all about. This is not some silly church ritual where we take a wafer and go home and live like hell and expect to go to heaven. This represents the body of Jesus beaten and broken because he loves you and he loves me. Let's not treat this as something insignificant or just some ritual. This is pointing to something like has never happened in the history of the world, God himself hung on a cross so we wouldn't have to. And he delivered us from hell. I'm thinking he deserves first place in our lives. I'm thinking he deserves to be ahead of everything else that we have going on. After all he did for you and after all he did for me. So let's bow our heads and pray and give him thanks for this. And if you need to repent, just say, Lord, forgive me for letting stuff creep in and become more important than you, even if it was just for a moment. And Father, we are grateful this morning for your body. We thank you that this represents so much more 
then what a cursory glance will reveal. And Lord, I pray that whenever it comes time for us to share in communion together, or any of these do it privately, that they would go all the way upstream and not just simply stop at the Last Supper and camp there, but see what having a body actually meant and the brutality that was going to come your way by putting that body on. And we thank you that you did it. And we thank you that, as you declared, nobody took your life. You laid it down of your own accord, and you took it up again. So we recognize you are indeed the Emmanuel, the God-man. You are the Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we give you thanks today. And we give you glory today. And I pray, Lord, we never look at the communion elements, especially the bread, the same as we have before. We honor you, we bless you, we praise you. And we partake together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at 53 to 58. And we'll continue our journey. Then Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at that last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now, as the bread was a metonym for sustenance, so too the cup of life's uh, sustaining drink. And we know you can go a lot longer without food than you can without drink. And so the incorporation of drink into the metaphor, while natural, its meaning too is supernatural. And the section opens with a qualifying statement that unless, meaning without eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of Man, Spiritual regeneration is impossible. That's the spiritual lesson. Now, we also need to note how radical these statements would have been to the Jews. Remember, they're in a synagogue in Capernaum. The restrictions of the kosher diet, the uncleanness associated with touching a dead body, to say nothing of the cannibalism that they thought he was implying, would come to their minds, and all of them would immediately gravitate to Leviticus 17, 10 to 14. Where the Lord said, whatever man of the house of Israel or the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against the person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to make, given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for what? Your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, no one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. Whatever man of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be hidden, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. What did Jesus say? You don't eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no eternal life. What were the two options for the listeners in the synagogue at Capernaum? They could say Jesus was asking them to violate the law. Did he do that? No. Or they could say, maybe we need to recognize that the Old Testament ordinances were pointing to something greater than themselves. And this was the better understanding. It's the right understanding. And the bread the Jews wanted was the bread that satisfies the flesh or the human appetite. But no amount of manna could stave off the great enemy of the second death. Because it's not possible, Hebrews 10.4 says, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now listen, we can also say it is not possible for a communion wafer and a cup of grape juice to take away sins. But they point to the one who did and whose blood paid the penalty for our sins. And listen, this is why I say we have to stay away from any casual approach to how magnificent and significant this is. And what the Jews were failing to recognize was that the countless blood sacrifices and offerings down through the ages pointed to the coming of a perfect sacrifice that would redeem man's soul. Now, here's the first thing we need to remember about the cup. Listen, simplistic, you already know it, but here it is in point form. 
The wages of sin must be paid in blood. The wages of sin must be paid in blood. And listen, contrary to what some teach and believe, nobody is born headed for heaven. Not even the Jews. No one could be born again and be headed for heaven if not for the blood of Jesus Christ. It is blood that makes atonement for the soul. And church, we need to recognize that Christianity is not simply a religious plan. It's the divine solution to man's sin problem. And Christ became a man to become our kinsman. But becoming our kinsman didn't save us because God coming in the world in the likeness of sinful flesh means that God came into the world in the likeness of sinful flesh. It was the shed blood that made atonement for our souls. And that shed blood required the human body that Jesus inhabited. After all, we just read from 1711 of Leviticus, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is what? The blood that makes atonement for the soul. And at the Last Supper, Matthew 26, 27 to 30, Jesus took the cup. It was the third cup of the Passover meal, the cup of redemption, and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is what? My blood of the new covenant. Was that really a cup full of blood? Well, it couldn't be. Jesus was standing right there. He hadn't poured out his blood yet. So does that not imply it was symbolic? And meant something else, pointed to something greater? And yes, Jesus said it's the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and we know what else happened there. Judas comes with soldiers, betrays Jesus with a kiss. Peter cuts off the high priest's servant Malchus' ear. Jesus heals the ear, sticks it back on the guy's head. And um, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but after seeing that, I think if I was a soldier, I'd have backed off. <laughs> well, listen, the bread of life reminds us that God humbled himself and became a man. And yes, Jesus' deity was clothed in humanity. Yes, his physical presence on earth and the miracles consistent with the God of heaven is a sign everyone demands to prove the existence of God. Yet we cannot overlook the fact that since the fall of man, all the way back in the garden, Innocent blood was shed to cover man's sin, and Adam and Eve's nakedness was covered by God slaying a sacrificial animal. Now, this is why communion is a solemn celebration. This is why the cup at the Last Supper was followed by singing. Because of the blood of Jesus, a new covenant was established, ending all the sacrifices and the repeated sacrifices and those that had to happen daily. A blood covenant that reconciled fallen man to a righteous and holy God was about to take place. It was an act that would never again need to be repeated, but should never, ever be forgotten. And this is what Jesus would have us to do today. Now let's wrap up with 60 to 66 and look at the most radical statement in all of Jesus' teaching ministry. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are what? Spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. The scene is very revealing about the condition of the human heart and how nothing can change society like knowing Jesus can. And obviously, one of the great benefits of knowing Christ is it alters our eternal destiny but some people come to Jesus today because heaven is very appealing. I mean, I've said this before. Any pastor that uh, is, has any type of gift of communication can get people's hands in the air. Who wants to go to heaven? All of the hands down in this room, you're in trouble because you didn't raise your hand. Now, listen. That's not what this is about. This isn't about manipulating people to do these things and, and offering something that, of course, would be appealing to the masses. 
But a lot of people respond to such an offer. Who wants to go to heaven? And then they hear something they don't like from the Bible, and they stop following him. Or they create a Jesus who is more to their liking. Now, this is really what the issue at hand is in the synagogue at Capernaum. There were expectations of the Messiah that were strictly related to this life and one's personal needs and desires. And Jesus had assaulted their thinking in that their mind they would say, why would a Jew need a Savior? We're Jews. We don't need a Savior. All we need is a provider. They think, you know, what we're after in a Messiah is one who would do stuff like part the Red Sea or provide water in the wilderness. And this is how many see him today. Many would even say, God is love, so because he's love, everybody goes to heaven. So therefore, the interaction of God with mankind can't be about getting to heaven. It has to be about him improving our this life circumstance, just like the Jews believed. And Jesus said in this passage and others, heaven is inaccessible apart from him. Who was he talking to? They were in a synagogue, and he's talking to Jews. Remember our PowerPoint that we studied a couple of weeks back? In John chapter 3, Jesus was talking to the teacher of Israel, and he said, you, Nicodemus, must be what? Born again. Now, the Jews didn't like this. As evidenced by John 5, 38 to 40, talking about the leading Jews. But you do not have his word abiding in you, Jesus said to them, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. And Jesus is telling the Jewish leadership, if you don't come to me, you don't have eternal life. The fact that God used the Jews to write the Old Testament didn't save you. And your searching of them doesn't save you. If you want to be saved, you have to come to me, is what Jesus is saying. And there are many today who have a mythical Jesus who is subservient to them. He's a provider and a healer and a savior, but he's not their Lord. There are many others who see no need for him because of their good behavior and they do nice things for other people and they're going to be rewarded with heaven. And it's also true that when some hear that he requires first place in your life, that we are to seek first his kingdom, that we are to esteem others better than ourselves, or that he is Lord of all or not Lord at all, they lose interest and they go their own way. I'm not looking for that kind of Messiah. I'm looking for one who can do stuff for me. Now, here's our last reminder about the cup and then we'll partake together. Listen this morning, God determines how to get to heaven, not man. God determines how to get to heaven, not man. And the cup, which represents the blood of Jesus, says, this is how one can access heaven. It's exclusively through his shed blood for our sins. And this is why Paul could say to the church at Galatia in 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in who? The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And listen, in our text, in the, in the Bread of Life discourse, it wasn't that Jesus hadn't made his case. In his three and a half year ministry, it wasn't that Jesus hadn't proven his deity. And it wasn't that his statements were inaccurate. They just didn't like what he said. It's just as simple as that. And the same is true in our world today. And this is why Jesus would say in Matthew 10, 32 to 33, Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever, what? Denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, as we've talked about many times, confess means to see as or speak of as the same. In other words, if you see Jesus as the Bible teaches him, then the Father in heaven is going to call you to him. You're, you're going to confess and see Jesus as the Bible presents him. But if you deny him, he will deny you before his Father who is in heaven. Now, Christians aren't perfect. I don't know. I got the same response in the first two services. <laughs> Christians are not perfect. None of them are perfect. He is our Savior. We make mistakes. We sin. But we see them as mistakes and sins. We don't justify them. We don't defend them. And when our sins are clearly defined in the Bible, we don't say that's not what the Bible means or they're 
are lots of interpretations and translations of the Bible. Listen, being a Christian is about believing all the Word of God. It's about believing all the Word of God, even as we often fail to live up to the Word of God. Or maybe we don't even like what it says. Some of you are probably thinking, how dare you say that there are parts of the Bible that we wouldn't like? Well, try this on. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. When's the last time you saw that on a t-shirt? You know why it's not on a t-shirt? Because nobody likes it. We don't like afflictions, right? How about this bumper sticker? If need be, you've been grieved by various trials. You like that? You like your trials? If you do, you can uh, see Pastor Lauren afterwards and he'll talk you through that. No, we don't like trials. And listen, believing Jesus is your Savior and believing the Bible is wrong on certain moral issues is to deny Christ because he is the Word of God. And the word deny means to contradict. Jesus says, you contradict my word, I will deny you in front of the Father. And the word deny means to reject. So if you contradict the word of God, when you stand before God, Jesus is going to reject you as one of his. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Well, I think he has a right to go strong on that because he shed his blood to buy you. He has every right to say how to get to heaven. And we have no right to say he ought to do it like this. And the cup which represents his blood reminds us that the conditions for salvation are defined by God. God said blood was required for sins to be forgiven. He sent his son to shed that blood. He said loving him is expressed by obeying his commandments and that his commandments are not limited to the words of Jesus and those who still like to say today, oddly enough, you know, you really only need to read the red letters in the Bible. Well, there's two problems with that. Uh, first of all, God, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the triune Godhead, wrote every word on every page of the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the words of the Holy Spirit written by the prophets and the historicists and the psalmists and the poets of the Old Testament and the prophets are equal to the words you find in red in your Bible because they're both God. And sorry to break it to some, but the old manuscripts didn't have red ink in them. So, listen. The cup represents Jesus' death as the bread represents Jesus' life and him coming in the flesh. To reject the conditions of the Bible on either belief or behavior is to walk with him no more. And we're not talking about perfectionism. We're talking about living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God because it's God's word that is perfect. So if we've accepted God's offer of forgiveness and all his terms and conditions of things pertaining to life and godliness, then we can come to this table as a solemn celebration. And we can say, you know what? Because of this, I have been set free. And he who the Son has set free is free indeed. And this cup reminds us salvation is impossible apart from the blood of Jesus. And it reminds us that those cleansed by the blood live like they have been. And they don't walk away from things they don't like, nor do they deny things or sins that may they, they, uh, they themselves may struggle to overcome. Listen, everybody gets tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was. I know this, this, hang on, this is going to be deep. Being tempted is not a sin. Sinning is a sin. Right? Everybody gets tempted. Jesus was tempted in all ways just as we are, yet without sin. That's why his blood was different than ours. Because it was absolutely perfect and untainted by sin. But listen, we also have to remember that because of this cup, we have the power to rise again, and the power of death has been destroyed. That's why communion is a solemn celebration. We have much to give thanks for when we come to the communion table. And listen, before we partake, uh, I just I've been asked over the years, multiple times, you know, uh, and some would share with me, you know, Pastor Chuck at communion. Uh, the first Wednesday every month. I think that's wonderful. And it's just a, a glorious thing to come to the table like we have today. 
But that's what the Lord laid on Pastor Chuck's heart. What the Lord laid on my heart years ago and what we've been doing for our 23 years of history is that when we finish a book, we have communion. And a lot of the books take a long time. Some of them take a couple of years. So the other times that we have communion is when God lays it on our heart. That's when we have it. You know why? Because I don't want anybody walking down the aisle taking a wafer from some guy and a sip out of a cup like it means absolutely nothing because it means absolutely everything. And I don't want to see it minimalized. And not that having it every month, the first Monday of the month was minimalizing. Good grief, if anybody exalted the cross and the blood of Christ as Pastor Chuck. Amen? So that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this is what God has laid on our hearts at this church. We have communion every Good Friday. We have family communion the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving every year. We have communion when we end the book. And we have communion when God says to. Because it's significant. And it's incredible. And it's powerful. And it's not ritual. It points to reality. That we have been set free. So, with that understanding, carefully take the membrane off your cup. Please do not spill the juice on our new chairs. And if you do, go your way and sin no more. 